Web design is a learnable skill, and today I'm going to teach you 24 fundamental concepts that every beginner should know, starting with the difference between web design and web development. Although some people think you can use these terms interchangeably, they're really two entirely different skill sets. Web design is the process of planning and building the visual elements on your website, whereas web development is taking your design and turning it into a live website. And we want to start with web design because developing takes a lot of time. And if we jump into developing without even a simple plan in place, we're going to waste a lot of time building the wrong things. Our website is going to look unprofessional and it'll be hard to add new content because we don't have systems in place for building it. That's why this series Web Design 101 is designed to teach you the fundamentals of web design. So before we start developing, we've got to go through the web design process, which starts with building a sitemap. A sitemap is the list of pages and sections on our website. On a live website, it lives in a file called the sitemap.xml, which search engines like Google can use to easily scan the content of your website. But building a good sitemap is also the first step of the web design process because it means we won't over or underdevelop our website. If we just spend a few minutes writing down the pages and the sections we'd like to build, it means we won't waste any time building things we don't need. Now to build your sitemap, it's as easy as loading up Google Docs and describing the pages and sections you'd like to build. And once you've written out your sitemap, the next step is to build your wireframe. A wireframe is a sketch of our website. It can be built in design tools like Figma or Sketch, but you can also just use a piece of paper if you'd like. And it's important to build a wireframe so we don't waste time developing a bunch of different layouts for sections before settling on something we like. It's much easier to spend a few minutes sketching out our website on a piece of paper than it is to spend hours developing and redeveloping a live website. Now, if you're starting with a blank page and you don't know what to sketch, that's totally okay. There's tons of websites online where you can find web design inspiration. For example, Lapa.ninja has a huge collection of websites sorted by category, OnePageLove.com has a collection of beautiful one-page websites, and Designspo.co is my own website where I show you the best website sections on the internet, along with a design lesson that explains what makes it so good. You can check those out in the description below, and you can go to Designspo.co backslash newsletter and get five free web design lessons sent to your inbox every Monday morning. Now, some people have asked me if modeling other websites is considered stealing. Which is fair, you know, you don't want to copy anything exactly. But you'll find that when you study these websites, the layouts they're using are largely the same from website to website. It's the content and the specific design decisions that they make, which makes them unique. So it's totally fine if you're inspired by a two column section on a great website, because that same layout already exists on thousands of other websites. But now that we've sketched the layout of our website, it's time to actually design it. To do that, we'll need to build a design system. A design system is a set of rules and components that we build for our website, which makes it look unique, consistent, and professional. This is where we'll use a design tool like Figma or Sketch, and in this video, I'll design in Figma, which is free and super easy to use. Now, a basic design system should include rules for color, typography, and spacing. It should also include common components like buttons, forms, images, cards, and whatever else you're going to use on your website repeatedly. And the best part of building a design system is that once you've actually created it, you get to design your website sort of like putting together a Lego set. You simply fit components together to build your unique designs. And if you want to see how the best web designers in the world build their design systems, Figma put together a great resource called designsystems.com, and they've got basically a collection of design systems built by companies like Microsoft, Google, Uber, and much more. But if you were to build the design system from scratch, how would you do it? Well, the foundation of a design system is built using something called a token. A token is a single rule about your design. For example, you might have a token named page background, which defines the background color of your pages. Or you might have a token named padding large, which sets the padding to, let's say, 32 pixels. All tokens have both a name and a value. That value can be a number like 32, it can be a color like blue, or it can even be another token like page background. Now to build a great design system, professional designers typically use two kinds of tokens, primitive tokens and semantic tokens. A primitive token is the most basic value in our design system. These are always single raw values. For example, you might have a primitive token named brand blue with a certain hex color code. A semantic token, on the other hand, references a primitive token and is applied to an element in your design. For example, you might have a semantic token button color with the value of brand blue. We use primitive and semantic tokens so that we can change something like the color of our buttons without changing everything else that also uses our brand color like a section background. 
And it's important to never use primitive tokens on your actual components because you won't be able to change that component without changing everything else that that token references. So we want to start by defining all the primitive tokens in our design system. That could be all the shades of our brand color or all the numbers we might use. So for example, if you watched my video on the four pixel rule, you'll know that a great way to create consistent looking websites is to make your tokens divisible by four pixels. So that means all the spacing, all the padding, all the roundness of your corners should be divisible by four pixels. Then we take those primitive tokens and map them onto our semantic tokens. So I might set my page background to neutral 50, my text color to neutral 1000, and my section padding to 32. If I want to change any of these elements at any time, I can change which primitive token my semantic tokens reference. So now that we've set up our design system, it's time to actually create our design. So now let's learn some important web design terminology, starting with absolute and relative sizing. Absolute sizing is when an element has a strict size, which is unaffected by anything else in the design. If I set my card's width to 500 pixels, it's 500 pixels no matter what, even if it clips out of the section. Relative sizing, on the other hand, is when the size of an element varies depending on the size of another element. For example, I have three cards on this page, which all take up 33% of the width. As I increase the width of the page, the cards get bigger, and as I decrease the width, they get smaller. This is called responsive design, when the same layout of elements changes depending on the screen size. But what if the screen gets so small that these cards just look terrible? What if we want to change the layout entirely? Well, that's called adaptive design and it's when the layout shifts depending on the screen size. For example, on desktop, we'll have three cards in a row, and on mobile, we'll have three rows of cards. A good designer would use responsive and adaptive design to build the best website possible. When you don't want the layout to shift, use responsive design. When you get above or below a certain size, like designing for a phone, use adaptive design. So now we know in theory how to make our website better suited for different screen sizes, but what are some of the values we can actually use to achieve this effect? Well, let's go through the different properties a typical website will use, starting with viewport height and viewport width. Now these are CSS terms, which stands for cascading style sheets, and they're basically a collection of styles that developers use to control the look of their website. So just like how a web designer uses tokens, a developer uses styles. Now let's get back to viewport width and height. The viewport itself is just what the browser can see at any one time. So it's not the same as screen size because the viewport's affected by the size of the browser window and any built-in browser UI. So viewport height, or VH for short, is a percentage of the measurement of the height an element takes up relative to the viewport. For example, a section with a height of 100 VH takes up 100% of the viewport. Same with viewport width. A section with the width of 50 VW takes up 50% of the viewport's width. Using a viewport can be great for big sections you want to let take up the entire page, but alone it's usually too finicky for most elements. You wouldn't want to define the size of a button by viewport width alone because it would look microscopic on small screens. But there are relative sizes that make designing easier, like M and REM. M is a size that's relative to the parent element's font size. That sounds, you know, kind of abstract, like who would ever use that, but it's actually the most commonly used sizing element on the web. That's because it allows us to size things relative to the other elements in a way that's consistent. For example, this button's font size is 12 pixels. Now, what if I wanted to make its horizontal padding twice the size of its vertical padding? I could use absolute terms like 24 pixels and 12 pixels, but what if I wanted to scale that button up or down and keep the ratio of 2 to 1? Well, instead of setting the horizontal padding to 24 pixels, I could set it to twice the font size or 2M, and I'll set the vertical padding to 1M. Now, if I change the font size to 16 pixels, the button grows proportionally. And this also means that if someone zooms in or out on your website, everything scales proportionally. This is insanely valuable, and we use it in web design all the time. Now, REM stands for root M, and it's sized relative to the root font size of your browser. For most browsers, this is 16 pixels, although you can change it to whatever value that you'd like. And just like M, it's also affected by zooming in and out. Now to combine everything we learned about responsive design, relative and absolute sizing, using the viewport and other values to our advantage, I wanna tell you about clamps. Clamps are the easiest way to scale an element relative to the viewport size without getting so huge or small that they break your design. And to demonstrate how clamps work, let's apply a clamp to a heading. First, a clamp has a minimum value. This is the absolute smallest our heading can be. Let's set this to 2 rem or 32 pixels. Next, we set a relative value. If we want the heading to get bigger as the viewport gets bigger, we'll use viewport width. 
So let's set the second value to 7% of the viewport width or 7VW. Finally, we'll set a maximum value. This is the largest our text can get. Let's set that to 6 RAM or 96 pixels. Now, if I put this into a browser, you'll see that our text gets smaller as we shrink the viewport until it gets to 2 RAM, and our text gets larger as we grow the viewport until it gets to 6 RAM. This is an incredible way to design responsive websites that look good at every screen size. And by the way, I've barely scratched the surface of what clamps can do. If you want to experiment with this, I'll leave a calculator tool in the description by Mark Bacon. It really is an incredibly powerful CSS tool. So this is how web developers get such granular control over their websites. They use CSS. And CSS is written in something called a style sheet. The style sheet controls all the things we've been talking about today, all the styles on your website. It controls the font size, the padding, the color, and every single style of every single element. So if you want to translate your design tokens into styles, you'll use the style sheet. Now to define a style within the style sheet, we'll need three things, a selector, a property, and a value. A selector is the element or group of elements you'd like to select. The property is the part of the element you'd like to change, and the value is what you'd like to change it to. For example, let's say you wanted to make all the buttons on your website blue. You would write it like this, button, background color, blue. And this is a Web Design 101 series. This is not going to be a deep dive into CSS, but if you want a deep dive, you can check out Free Code Camp, which is a full CSS course for beginner developers. But now that we've covered the basics of design, the final term that I want to share with you today is user experience or UX. UX is simply how it feels to use and navigate your website. Good UX is more important than fancy design or next level graphics or flashy animations. There are websites without any of that stuff that are still easy and enjoyable to use. Good UX boils down to two questions. What do you want visitors to do on your website and how can you make it easier or more enjoyable? A great first step to leveling up your user experience is to map out a visitor journey. From the time they load your website to the time they book a call or buy your product, what do visitors actually have to do? Remember, it should be as simple and as obvious and as enjoyable as possible. That's why we take the time to build a site map and sketch a wireframe and build a clean, consistent and professional design system. All these things make your website easier and more enjoyable to use. You have to put the interest of your visitors first so that the second they're ready to take action, it's only a click away. Now, if you enjoyed this video and want to watch another in this series, you can check out this video here on how to design websites 10 times faster. But that's all for me today. I hope you found this valuable and I'll see you in the next one.